I so adore filming in my room where half of my face is lit by this window and the other half is just in the dark and then the whole quality is blurry. But I don't have lighting to fix it. It's stunning. Hello my dears, welcome to the weird lighting that is my room. Uh, somebody recently asked me about the medical model of disability versus the social model of disability and I realized that I've somehow forgotten to make a video about it. Even though I talk about these concepts in just about every single one of my videos, but for some reason I have never specifically used these terms. For some reason I'm genuinely baffled by it, but anyway, let's write this wrong and talk about what these terms mean and why they're important things to know about. Also, quick shout out slash special thanks to at Autistic Park Ranger on Instagram. I kind of based this off of her posts on this topic. Um, I fully plan to change a lot of her wording, but because she may or may not be my older sibling and we therefore talk the same, a lot of this is going to be directly quoting by accident. But thank you, definitely anonymous random park ranger who I definitely don't know for your unwitting help in creating this video. If you all don't follow her, go do so. All of her posts are in her handwriting as a font, which is super fun and spicy. Um, but anyway, let us start with the medical model of disability. Now, the first thing to know is that the word medical here is not directly related to medical professionals or medical practice, though there are many connections obviously between this idea and a solid chunk of the medical field. It is also often described as pathologizing disabilities. Basically, this idea of disability is that a disability is something physically wrong with a person's mind or body that is making them suffer and reducing their quality of life and therefore needs to be fixed. Medications, therapies, and assistive devices can minimize or cure this disability so the person can live a normal life. And if this thing is not fixed, the person is less productive and therefore an unequal member of society. Now, in regards to accessibility, the accommodation in this case is the responsibility of the disabled person. If there's only a staircase at the door of a building, well, the problem is actually the person's wheelchair, not the existence of the stairs. The disabled person is responsible for putting in the effort, time, and money to make sure that their disability does not inconvenience other people. But also, at the same time, because of our disability, we cannot make good informed decisions in our life and others must decide everything for us. Yay! And the extremes of this model, you may be thinking, well, it justifies controlling the lives of disabled people medically, economically, educationally, and even reproductively, which we'll talk about in a few weeks in a really sad video, um, as well as treating us as if we don't know ourselves, can't make our own decisions, and treating us as less than other people. So unfortunately, eugenics is still alive and well in this world, and if you didn't know that, I'm so happy for you. We will go into this whole situation in a video in a few weeks. Now, the medical model of disability was used to define disability by the World Health Organization until 2001. And because of that, a solid majority of our current medical world was taught to view disability according to this model since, well, it's what was taught and used at the time of their training. I find overwhelmingly with like three-ish exceptions that the older a doctor I go to, the more likely they are to not listen to me and or diminish my symptoms, tell me I'm faking, or when they do believe me, tell me, well, maybe I just shouldn't have children because, you know, I'm a bit of a mess. And this is not saying that all doctors are bad or even that all old doctors are bad because there are some great ones. But if you are chronically ill and feel like you are hitting a wall with every single doctor you go to, I just wanna say that I had that experience too and younger doctors tend to work better for me and I feel a lot better with the medical community now. Probably because those people are more likely to be trained with a less limitation focused and paternalistic view of disability. Um, you know, obviously disability advocates like myself reject this model of disability, hence my annoyingly sarcastic tone throughout this whole section, because the vibes are just not there. We instead prefer the social model of disability, which basically says that we are disabled by barriers in society, not by being different, and that we can create equality for everybody, letting disabled people be a part of society as full members by removing these barriers. Now the model breaks up these barriers into five categories. The first category is or are attitudinal barriers, which are behaviors, perceptions, and assumptions about disabled people that often come from a lack of education and understanding, aka ableism. And I would like to remind the non-disabled people here that disabled also struggle with internalized ableism because it's an integral part of our society and our upbringing and it's really difficult to break. So you're not alone in this, especially for late disabled people like myself because we have a good deal of learning to do 
very quickly. And I know that I am still unpacking and processing a lot of stuff because almost every time I think of a new video topic and then I begin to research it, I find some sort of murky bit and gray area in my brain that I still have to figure out and process. And that's totally okay. That's totally normal. It is nothing to be ashamed of. And what's important is that you are willing to learn and that you're trying to get better. Seriously, that's a big deal. I'm proud of you. You should be proud of you too. Yay. Now some examples of attitudinal barriers in addition to everything in my ableism video, which I will link. It's on my left. Yeah, I will link right here. Are assuming a disabled person is inferior or less worthy because we are disabled. Assuming a nonverbal slash non-speaking person cannot understand what you are saying. Forming your understanding of a disabled person based on stereotypes. Feeling like you are doing somebody a big favor by giving them accommodations and so much more. And now these things may seem like they're quiet, non-obvious things that don't cause real damage, but it's important to remember that ideas like this come out into your actions. And I will be the first to tell you that actions, despite great intentions behind them, can have terrible impact. Because the majority of my disabilities are a direct result of that. So just make sure that you're confronting this kind of stuff. It's really, it's really important. It's really a great thing for you to be doing. So thank you for being here. But I digress. Back to our kinds of barriers. The second are organizational and systemic barriers. These are policies, procedures, and practices that discriminate against and prevent disabled people from participating fully in a situation. These are also often unintentional due to lack of awareness. So to people who say I talk about about disability too much, well, now you know why. Some examples of these include requiring students to take a full course load to remain enrolled, having a no returns policy at a clothing store, which assumes that everybody can try on the clothing inside the store or even get to the store, requiring meetings to be in person at a certain time without any options for calling in, not listing allergens on things or having the option to make something allergen friendly, and not having any places to sit, not allowing water bottles slash food into places or events, etc, etc. Then we have architectural and physical barriers, which are elements of buildings and outdoor spaces that physically prevent access, otherwise known as Italy. I'm joking, but I'm also very much not. Anyway, so some examples are why is it so dark over there? Some examples are sidewalks, doorways, and hallways that are too narrow to accommodate a wheelchair or other mobility devices, desks and tables built too high for wheelchair access, poor lighting preventing lip reading, sorry if that's my fault right now, uh, doorknobs requiring a closed grip to use, bathroom stalls too small to handle mobility devices and caregivers, and many more. I did an independent study in high school on American Sign Language and Deaf Culture, um, which was my first introduction to the social model disability before I even considered myself to be disabled, though I totally was, but denial and whatnot. But I learned a lot about uh, accessible architecture and it's super, super cool. So I'm, I'm compiling some information and some research and I will make a video about that at some point. As you may be able to tell, I have quite the queue going. Our next group of barriers are informational and communicational barriers. These occur when sensory and learning disabilities have not been considered and they prevent the sending and receiving of information. This includes electronic documents that aren't digitally formatted for screen readers, videos without closed captioning and transcripts, print that's too small, font that's super difficult to read, and poorly organized lectures, which lose students who need a clearly defined structure from the start. Then the last group is technological barriers, which occur when a device or platform is not accessible to its intended audience and cannot be used with assistive devices. It is often similar and kind of like vaguely combined and indistinguishable from um, informational and communicational barriers, but it also has its own section. Some examples of this include electronic documents that don't contain any alt text for screen readers to describe the pictures, having handouts and materials only made in hard copies without a braille or electronic option, and the required website for applying to a job that cannot be accessed by assistive devices with no alternative methods of applying. This model of disability demands solutions for all access to all things, not because disabled people are needy people, but because when everybody is included, we're all better off. Some basic examples of things made for disabled people that we all use every single day include texting, automatic doors, subtitles, curb cuts, and sidewalks, which are super helpful for luggage and strollers, fidget toys, elevators, and countless, countless other things. So to people who complain about disabled people needing too much or trying to change the way we do things, a lot of the way that we do things are because of disabled people. So, so please, please just 
be quiet because you have no idea what you're talking about and it's just it's offensive and it's a waste of your energy. Since this model sees disabled people as human beings with rights who are able to speak up for themselves, make decisions about their lives, and be active members of society, you can just listen to us instead. That's also really great. I think that would be a much better use of your time and energy. Now, it's important to recognize that increasing access does sometimes require a bit of a shift in perspective. I mean, sure, it may take you an extra minute to make a large print version of the audition text for that actor who is low vision, but he ended up changing the world to making history as the first openly autistic person to play Christopher Boone in Curious Incident, which is invaluable. Without taking that extra 60 seconds, you'd have totally missed out on something incredible. Also, in case you don't know, that is the true story of my good friend Mickey Rowe. If you don't know who he is, I did a really great interview convo thing with him a few months ago about inaccessibility in theater, which I think is really interesting, but maybe I'm biased. You can watch that video up here. Now, overall, everyone has every single right to be included in any space, regardless of accommodations that that person may need to be an equal participant in that space. Disabled people are not a negative strain on the population. We're a natural and celebrated aspect of human diversity, which if you're watching my videos, you probably already know that, but just, you know, throwing that one out there. And that is the social model of disability. Uh, some people oppose this model saying that it's impractical, but just to clarify that one, if you developed a disability, and then you joined our community, we're not gonna say, hey, yay, you're disabled, you're perfect just the way you are. Never see a doctor again because they'll try to fix you and you don't need to be fixed. At least in my experience in this community, everybody wants you to do everything that you can to make sure that you're not suffering because we know what it's like to suffer and we don't want that to happen. So please investigate what's going on with your body. See if any of it can be made any better for you. But it's also important to acknowledge that for some people like myself, bouncing from doctor to doctor to doctor, trying to find some magical cure that simply does not exist and continuously trying medication after medication with awful side effects and then getting your hopes up and dashed over and over and over again is suffering too. For example, I spent six years trying to pretend that my migraines would just go away and trying so many medications and going to so many doctors. And even though my migraines are technically worse now, I physically felt so much worse then than I do now because I spent some time learning how to listen to what my body was trying to tell me with those migraines and just changed my lifestyle to take better care of myself, which was so much less emotionally exhausting. The biggest part of the social model of disability is that the world should accommodate you and that also you should accommodate you because we are all human beings too. So there we go. There's your medical versus social model of disability video. I hope that you learned a thing and I haven't done my outro in a while. So thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember your story isn't over. It has only just begun. And I look forward to seeing you, my dears, in the next one.